All right, G. Hello, everyone who is watching currently and in the future. This will be the CNL team zooplankton presentation. A report has been personally written about all the information here, but of course, this is just going to be a more broad depiction of everything that I have been doing for my project. And for those who were there at the dive house the other night, I had actually presented some of the same information. But for those who have not met me yet, my name is Anthony Tamborelli, and I'm a junior at Montclair State University working for my marine biology and coastal sciences degree. I've been working in the laboratory with Dr. Paul Bologna for roughly a year and a half. And for those who do not know him, you may know him as Dr. Jellyfish. He has been working with Barnicat Bay for a few years now and working towards working with jellyfish populations and monitoring them and keeping them in check. But I've also been working with him personally for a few years, or specifically a year and a half, in order to work on some projects that he's been working on. But for the summer, I've been working with, say, Barnicat Bay personally for a student grant program to work with some of the projects that he has been working with as well. We were working with zooplankton populations and jellyfish populations within Barnicat Bay and monitor them and seeing how they change over time. So for a basic abstract of what we're gonna be going over today, we are gonna be discussing some of the basics with zooplankton and their importance to the ecosystem. We'll be going over some specifics about the project and what I've done, for example, the different sites that I visited and different types of data that I have collected and the different trends that I have pieced together based on the data that I've collected. We'd also be going over some trends that we had seen with some of the organisms and the interactions that they have with each other. We'll also be going over more specific interactions with the sea nettles, a notorious jellyfish that we'll describe in a little bit of detail to come, and also the overall importance of this project for not only current works, but also future works to come. So for a basic understanding for those who may not know exactly what zooplankton are, but for those who do know what zooplankton are, this will be a little bit of a pressure. Zooplankton are essentially any marine organism that cannot really swim effectively against the current. Now, they may be able to travel a little bit in their own space, but they cannot travel vast distances. And of course, some exceptions are, of course, those that can migrate from very deep waters to more shallow waters in order to feed on organisms during the night. But of course, it gets very specific on how diverse these organisms can be. So very general basic understanding of these organisms is essentially that if there is a strong current, they will not be able to really swim great against these currents. And of course, it goes without saying that these organisms will vary both in how they behave, the type of organisms that they consume and the different type of activities that they'll conduct. But it can get even more specific with the fact that some of these organisms are permanent members of the zooplankton communities and cannot really mature out of these stages and are forever pitted against the current. And of course, there are examples, for example, crab larva or fish larva that are actually at a young stage unable to swim against these currents, but as they grow into older adults, they'll mature out of the stage and actually be able to swim against these currents. Despite this debilitation, these organisms are actually very important for some of the ecosystems that they're a part of. A good example is this calanoid copepod depicted here. This is a type of crustacean that can be found in Barnegat Bay. They're very tiny, however, despite their size, they're actually very integral to the ecosystems that they're a part of. For example, again, with these organisms, they are an essential level of the food web because they eat smaller organisms called phytoplankton that harness the sun's energy and turn it into their own energy. They are essentially like the plants of the marine world. And without this crucial step, with the copepods not eating these organisms, the bigger predator items that will eventually consume all of these down the line will not be able to survive. So two good examples are bay, anchi, excuse me, bay anchovies or the striped bass that will consume those organisms eventually. These two levels will not be able to harness this energy because the anchovies won't be able to eat the copepods and the striped bass won't be able to eat the anchovies. So without this integral level, the higher levels will just collapse. And in one way or another, we won't be able to reap these benefits because some people either rely on these fish for recreation or for industries. So they won't be able to have the same type of support economically or for the recreation without this integral step. In biology, we usually see that there are going to be fluctuations with various aspects, including the populations of certain organisms. And for the zooplankton, we often see that these trends fluctuate because of natural occurrences such as predators or resources or even water conditions. A trend we usually see is that as the summer starts to get warmer, nutrients are added into the system as phytoplankton begin to conduct photosynthesis and they 
these zooplankton populations start to grow with the abundance of this food. As the summer starts to die down, though, and it gets colder, the resources are starting. start to eat all these unnatural fluctuations that did not really conform with some of these other trends that I had mentioned. And a good example of this is Chrysler Chesapeake guy. This is the scientific name for the sea nettle, aka the bay nettle, depending on what sources that you check, because the name is still pending. Nonetheless, this organism is dangerous for a variety of reasons. For one, they eat anything in their path and will consume essentially anything from the zooplankton we had mentioned. They'll eat other jellyfish and they'll eat even younger fish larvae or fish that are happened to caught in their tentacles. On top of this, they do not have a lot of natural predators, so they are often not really stopped if they do grow to great numbers. And speaking of, in the recent years, their numbers have actually increased considerably. One theory has been because that the water has been declining in quality, so the organisms that they are trying to hunt cannot really swim away as effectively because they're not as healthy. So these organisms are able to actually thrive in this better environment for catching prey and therefore have been able to grow abundantly over the years. So an organism like this is actually an epitomal reason on why some scientists such as myself have begun to monitor these zooplankton populations. Not only to see how are these prey populations doing, but also how are the predator populations doing in turn. So for Save Bonnicket Bay, I have been working with Dr. Paul Bologna personally in what we have dubbed the sea nettle team, both to monitor the zooplankton populations and the jellyfish populations, such as the sea nettles over the years. And we had primarily for this summer tried to do exactly that, sample different zooplankton communities within Barnicket Bay during the summer at different sites, and to see not only how these populations have changed over time in terms of their numbers, but also to see if it's the same quality or to see if they have changed in terms of the dynamics or what type of organisms were present. And to the same degree, we were doing the same thing for any jellyfish populations we had seen in the bay. So for our work, we would mainly do stuff out into the field, but we would also break that stuff back into the lab and do stuff then. For our field work, we were primarily rendezvousing or meeting up at Fork River State Marina early in the morning. This was primarily to not only avoid incoming traffic in the afternoon, but also the waters just get rougher in the afternoon as the winds pick up and naturally the weather starts to become more inclement. So that's when we usually like to get out. At each site, when we depart from the marina and hit each site, we will try to conduct the same type of activities at each site. For example, we will try to take different water qualities and see how the water is doing. And this could be with our temperature or the oxygen content in the water. But we'll also take other pieces of information, such as where we are, what time it is when we're starting to sample, and how far we have traveled during our samplings. We'll also take note of the depth of the sites in question for future reference, but of course our more important aspects to take note of are our plankton toe and lift net samplings. Essentially, plankton toes are a type of net where when dragged through the water, they are kind of like a very long coffee filter. They'll be dragged through the water and any zooplankton or fish that are happen to catch into it will not be able to catch out. And usually it's a type of net that usually favors the smaller organisms so we're able to actually sample them and take samples of them. At each site, we usually take a minimum of three. However, we usually take a fourth one for an excess project that Dr. Bologna is a part of regarding DNA in the area, but that's for a separate project. So I'll try not to get too in depth with it. Another type of sampling we do is with our lift nets. Essentially, we drop them into the water, wait a few seconds and pull anything up. This is better for some other macroscopic or larger organisms that might be in the area, such as jellyfish or other types of jelly related organisms, such as comb jellies, which I'll mention in a little bit and we'll take a minimum of 10 of these at each site. Regardless of any sample that we take, we'll try to store in plastic jars filled with ethanol, which is a type of alcohol-based chemical that allows these organisms to not really fall apart into mush. They'll basically preserve it better in these samples. And with that, we usually do these with the plankton toes because usually with our lift nets, what we do is we will pull up anything that we can obviously see, whether it be like sea nettles or comb jelly species, which I'll mention in a little bit. We'll count them on site and size them and then release them back in the water. So it's primarily these plankton toe nets that we'll keep for future reference for data. We had also conducted dock swabs at two sites. We had conducted sites at Sunrise Beach Lagoon and Berkeley Shores, and dock swabs are essentially where we take swabs 
we'll rub them up against the bottom of bulkheads or on the sides of docks in various spots in the area. And then we'll take these in vials to a partner laboratory at Montclair State University in order to test for the presence of C-nettle DNA. And essentially the DNA would test to the presence of polyps, which are basically immature jellyfish that are able to duplicate in mass numbers. So of course the presence of these polyps would hint that the areas that we have found are breeding grounds that need to be monitored just in case these C-nettles are able to grow in bigger numbers because of this. So this is an example of a CNO that we have caught in the field. As you can see, it's very translucent in color, yet it's still got a very firm shape to it. And to the picture here, we can actually see Dr. Bologna kissing it to prove to us it's not too dangerous to humans. Of course, it could still have a little bit of a sting, but he was proving to us that it's not like the lion's mane or the clinging jellyfish that have actually hospitalized people with the pain that they have experienced. To the right, we have pictures of the different instruments that we had used out into the field. For example, we have the YSI to take water quality. We essentially have a little probe here that we stick into the water and it does a bunch of different things and takes a bunch of different information about the water. For a GPS, we mainly take positional values and watch it to see where our coordinates are before and after a sample so we can reference how far we have traveled. But more specifically, we use the flow meter for that purpose by sticking it into the water and see how fast it spins and how the numbers have changed on the dial. And that will be able to allow us to calculate the exact distance that we have traveled while sampling. Once we get into the lab, we'll take all of our samples and sort onto shelves to the best of our ability. But first and foremost, we'll dye everything with Rose Bengal, which is essentially a type of chemical that will enunciate all the organisms by essentially binding to proteins or just to living tissue for an organism and will turn it pink. So it's a lot easier to see under the microscope. Once we do get around to processing a sample, we'll first transfer it to a sieve. This essentially is a disc with a mesh that allows bigger organisms to be kept, but any smaller debris or organisms that are not focal to the project to pass through and go down the drain. Once everything is transferred through the sieve and collected, we'll transfer it to trays, and then we'll count everything under a microscope. And this can be as specific as a certain species or a more broader taxonomic grouping, or just a type of organism overall that we might want to categorize. And if there's any algae or seagrass or any type of plant that we have also coincidentally caught in these samples, we'll separate them into pans and dry them and weigh them and ash them just to see how much carbon was essentially in that sample. Once everything is counted, it will be transferred to a vial such as this, also stored with ethanol to preserve everything that we had caught. But it also has a duplicate data label with everything that was written on an original data label that we had had at the site with various pieces of information that would be essential to know in the future. Again, like the type of site that it is, when we had gone out to that site, what type of sample it is, and if there's anything specific that we should keep note of in that sample. If there isn't anything that we don't essentially know what it is, like we aren't able to actually identify it ourselves, we'll separate it for Dr. Bologna to identify himself, and then he'll add it to the vial at the end and also take note of what we had counted. Once we are completely done with counting everything, we will record it on data sheets for future reference, and then we'll put our vial on the shelf just in case we need to refer back to it. And of course, this data on these data sheets are very important because they essentially show us what we had seen at that time and at that site during the time, and therefore we'll be able to compile all the data or put it all together in the future and kind of see what we had seen at different points in time and then be able to form trends on what we had seen. And of course, it's always interesting to see what is in a particular sample, not only for different sites, but also different samples for the same site. So we usually are pretty excited to see what we do eventually get in the end. This is an example of a sample that we could take back to the laboratory, and we can see an inside view with the sample currently dyed with Rosemann Gao. We have the original data label presented here with the site date type of sample and also any miscellaneous notes that we may need. And we also see some organisms already present that we could count. This is a cone jelly that will be described momentarily. And of course, we will try to sort our samples just in case we need to look back to it and make any changes to our data. And of course, this is actually quite empty compared to what we have now in the laboratory because we've been busy with processing samples even from previous months like in May. So this is a small snapshot of some of the organisms that we could potentially see. Of course, the key word is small because the potential list of organisms that we can see is pretty vast. But of course, this is just a small selection of some of the more organisms that we had seen. One good example is Demiopsis ladii. This is a comb jelly or a cousin of the jellyfish, to put it simply, that I'll also describe. 
described in previous slides. These organisms are very simple. They're also very fragile in form, but it's always interesting to note that they come in very different sizes, especially in the same sample. And we also try to size it to the best of our ability before we take it to the laboratory because they do not preserve well. They actually turn to mush. So of course, it's kind of like counting apples as opposed to counting applesauce. It's just impossible. So of course, we try to take precautions so we save us a headache later on down the road. This organism was not actually a part of this project, but I thought it would be interesting to include just for interesting references for some of those that do not know about this organism. This is the clinging jellyfish I had mentioned earlier. This organism, despite being only the size of a quarter, is actually relatively dangerous and causes people pain that increases in intensity after they have gotten stung. So of course, an organism like this that I was coincidentally able to see in miscellaneous projects and miscellaneous samplings during the summer and was actually able to hold a tank full of them in the laboratory, I thought would be an interesting thing to include. Of course, these organisms are frequenting in Barnegat Bay as well, so at certain sites it's always interesting to note what organisms are present and what dangers they could pose. I believe Dr. Bologna's Facebook page, New Jersey Jelly Spotters, has more information about these organisms that you could check out on your free time. Of course, there are gonna be some miscellaneous organisms that we may see in our samples as well. One example is this isopod species here. It's essentially a relative to the pill bug on land. But of course, this organism is just one of the many types of organisms that we can see in our samples. Some more common types of organisms that we may see are such as things like calamid copepods, which I described earlier, shrimp larva or baby shrimp, to put it simply, fish eggs of various different types of fish. It could vary depending on what we see. We also see these gastropod larvae or snail larvae and their very basic forms. And also some other miscellaneous organisms like this very interesting looking organism here. This is known as a clodocerin or the specific species of Vadne normani. They are also part of the zooplankton. And again, it's also interesting to note just how many different types of organisms we can see, but also the frequency of how often some of these species are between our samples. So for this project, we had sampled in southeastern New Jersey's Barnegat Bay at four specific sites, Bayshore Lagoon, Forked River Lagoon, Sunrise Beach Lagoon, and Berkeley Shores, all accessed from Forked River State Marina, which is depicted here. And of course, an interesting thing to note about all these sites is essentially they are all residential areas right up against canals or inlets, however you want to describe it. So of course, it's not only too important to consider that the people at these areas would have an effect on the water, but it's also vice versa. The waters will have an effect on the people. So let's take an example like the sea nails that we have been seeing in greater numbers over the years. Essentially, these organisms have been predating or attacking and eating these other organisms so well that they've caused declines. And for the people, of course, not only are extra jellyfish in the water dangerous just in case they get stung, but also these jellyfish have been taking away resources and fish that some people both rely on for recreational fishing or also for industrial fishing like crab farmers who aren't able to actually harvest these crabs because in their smallest states as their larva or baby versions they're essentially taking out of the environment before they can actually grow to greater numbers. So of course it's not only important to educate the public about what dangers are in the water but also what dangers are possibly to come but in addition to educate the people on how they could possibly protect themselves from these dangers and also educate them on some type of steps that they could potentially take to help us scientists with their active efforts to decrease these sea nettle populations from growing to a point where we won't be able to really save other organisms in the area. So for a general timeline of the site sampling that I had done, we had started officially on May 24th. However, our two primary sampling dates were on June 17th and July 15th. We had sampled all of the aforementioned four sites. We had sampled Bay Bayshore Lagoon, Berkeley Shores, Fort River Lagoon, and Sunrise Beach Lagoon on both dates. We had also taken the dock swabs at Berkeley Shores and Sunrise Beach Lagoon on both dates. Unfortunately, we had gone out on August 10th for our third sampling date. However, of course, it's not enough time to properly compile all this data or even process it, considering all the other samples that we still have to go through. So unfortunately, this data wasn't able to be included or analyzed for this presentation or this project as a whole. So for very basic distinctions or trends for some of these sites to give it a face value level are gonna be described here. Of course, there are more specific trends for some of these sites that we'll be going over. And of course, there might be more truthful trends for some of these sites per se. But of course, this is a very generalized way to kind of imagine some of these sites. 
So for Bayshore Lagoon, we had essentially seen the lowest species diversity amongst all the sites. And what this essentially means is that Bayshore Lagoon had the fewest number of species compared to the other sites. For example, if I remember correctly, in July, we had seen only six different types of organisms at the site as compared to Forked River Lagoon in that month, which actually had 10 different types of organisms. So it's interesting to see which sites actually have the most species diversity. And species diversity essentially not necessarily hints at a healthier environment, but also just shows that there's more diversity in different types of organisms there. For Forgy River Lagoon, we had seen sea nettle ophira, which are essentially very immature and young jellyfish. And we had seen a lot of these, especially in June for the site. Forky River Lagoon, as previously mentioned, also had the highest species diversity in July. We'd also seen various types of plants in our lift net sampling, such as algae and seagrass for the site specifically, and we hadn't really seen plants for other lift net samplings for other sites. For Summer's Beach Lagoon, we had seen a lot of miscellaneous uh, jellyfish ophira, or essentially different types of jellyfish that we hadn't specifically identified, but had still seen in some of our samples. We also saw a lot of comb jellies specifically in July at the site. We'd also seen the largest individuals from the comb jellies at these sites, where essentially just the organisms were present at their largest sizes at the specific site. For Berkeley Shores, we had also seen some comb jellies at the site, but more so specifically in June. But most importantly, we had seen CNL adults specifically at the site in July in the greatest numbers. So the following slides are going to include information from June and July's plankton toe, lift net, and water quality data. Essentially, it is just a compilation of all the data that we had collected from each individual type of sampling, and the water quality was taken just to see how the water is doing and what their quality is, and also Primarily for professional etiquette, it's an important piece of information to take just in case any trends that we see for our other types of data possibly tie back to our water quality. So it's an important piece of information to include. There will be slides in the future that will describe more specific trends for each of these, but of course these following slides are going to be a quick look on what we had found for each month. So for our plankton toe data in June, we had seen a considerable amount of different types of organisms present between all four sites. However, we had seen that a lot of these groupings were actually in very low densities, where essentially what we tested for was how often does a species or an organism come up based on a certain volume of water? And this allows us to kind of compare how frequent some of these organisms are compared to others. So what we had seen was that a lot of these were in very low densities, so not really in as great as numbers as compared to others. However, there were some select organisms such as the Chrysiorophyra and Nemeopsis ladii or the comb gel, excuse me, the comb jelly that were present in greater numbers in comparison to others. Excuse me, my goat's going a little hoarse. Hmm, my apologies. All right, so for our LiveNet data for June, what we had seen was that sea nettles, Nemeopsis ladii, and one other jellyfish species known as Demopsis beckii, all three of these had different favorabilities depending on their sites. Sea nettles and Nemopsis had specific favorability for some sites. However, Nemeopsis was present at all sites. And again, some more specific trends will be described shortly. For our water quality, we had taken salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, oxygen saturation, and conductivity, which is essentially tied into salinity. And this was for all four sites at both months. And again, this was taken for professional etiquette and also to compare trends and see if there are any connections. And more specific trends for all these will be described in the upcoming slide. For July, what we had seen was that the number of organisms present had essentially declined. Even though most of them were still present in very low amounts, there were some that were present in greater densities or greater amounts from the previous month that had actually declined considerably. For lift nets, we had also seen some shifts. For example, sea nettles were now present at Berkeley Shores as opposed to Forker River Lagoon. Nemopsis had completely disappeared from our observations and our comb jelly species had shifted variably between some of the sites. Water quality was also taken for this month and future trends will be described in the upcoming slide. So essentially for our plankton toads, we had seen trends based on species diversity or how many types of organisms were present, average densities, or just how frequent or how large of numbers some of these organisms were, and the species dominance, or essentially which organism was present the greatest at a site for a certain month, or also just 
how frequent was a certain organism to the point where it was actually the most frequently seen organism throughout the entire sampling period. So we'll be going over some specifics shortly. So as I described previously with species diversity, the number of organisms had declined between the two months overall. And we had seen that there was also a shift because in June, Sunrise Beach Lagoon and Berkeley Shores had the greatest number of organisms types present. But in July, we had seen Florida River instead had the greatest number of organisms present. For our average densities, as previously described, a lot of them are present in very low numbers. And this was also seen in the upcoming month. However, some of the organisms that were present in greater densities, for example, the Chrysaeora fire, had declined considerably. So, of course, to compare these two things or kind of analyze why this was happening, some things that we had hypothesized or kind of pondered on was that these declines, both in the number of organisms and also the densities of the organisms, these had possibly declined because of natural processes that I had described earlier. As the summer is decreasing, the resources are gonna start declining as they're being used in abundance and predators are starting to attack these populations that have been growing in enough numbers where it's just a buffet. So obviously these declines are expected as the summer progresses. So it's not necessarily too alarming to expect. However, we had already described the dangers of sea nettles in these organisms' habitats. So, of course, another hypothesis was that the effect of sea nettles in these habitats have potentially impacted these other populations because we know that they have a great predative effect on these organisms and also are able to eat them very effectively. So, possibly their declines are also in turn due to the sea nettles' presence. For species dominance, who are essentially what organism was present the most at a certain site, we had described some basics for some of the sites for some of the months on a previous slide. However, what we had seen collectively amongst all four sites for some of the months, we had seen that our comb jelly species, Nemeopsis labii, and our calmid copepod, crustacean zoopopods, were essentially the organisms that were present in the greatest numbers overall between June and July. They were the greatest amongst all four sites for both of these months. In June, we had seen Chrysaeora afire or C. nettle afire present in one of the top three as well. But in July, the other top three was with crab larva present in one of the greatest numbers. For lift nets, we actually see a very interesting trend that is very easily described and actually expected. So we had seen trends pertaining to sea nettles, our comb jelly species, and also our other jellyfish species, Nemopsis bacchiae. So for sea nettles, we had seen that a lot of the sea in Fork River had declined, and we had seen a slight increase at Berkeley Shores. However, the interesting trend is with the comb jelly species. What we had seen essentially was that at any site where sea nettles were present, the Nemeopsis densities had declined considerably. And of course, we can see this between Berkeley Shores and Fork River, or the orange and the green bars, which have declined considerably or completely disappeared. Inversely, what we had seen was that comb jelly species had increase considerably in densities wherever sea nettles were not present. So in other words, sea nettles were not present at Sunrise Beach and Bayshore Lagoon. So coincidentally, we had seen an increase in our comb jelly densities. So of course, what we can obviously see here is that sea nettles have a very heavy effect on survival of these comb jelly species. Of course, this is actually expected since we know that sea nettles are able to consume these other organisms. But nonetheless, it's interesting to see the dynamic or the trends that we would see for these predators and see how over time, what organisms they would target and also kind of hypothesize how much of an impact they would have on specific organisms and their species. For Nemopsis, we had seen a very peculiar trend. To put it simply, they were present in very low densities in June, however, completely disappeared from our observations in July. Now, I had tried looking for excess information and external sources that kind of provide a hypothesis for me to ponder on. However, not enough information was actually given to me to formulate a proper hypothesis. So Dr. Bologna and I had pondered that these organisms were either uncommon for the area and they're just not in as great of numbers for us to actually sample them as easily, or it could be that their life cycles had lined up in a way where they just died off and we were unable to really collect them. Of course, we were not really able to test this specific hypothesis as it was outside the scope of the research. So future generations or future research projects would be necessary in order to test to see what the specific reasonings are for this trend. And of course, this is the same as any type of thing in science. If we don't necessarily know why, we would need another research or study to kind of prove why. It's always good to not only come up with an idea, 
but also to possibly ponder on why and then further test why this is actually true or excuse me, true or false. So for our water quality, once again, I had mentioned I had taken it for both months for all four sites. And essentially this is to monitor the water and to see how healthy it is per se over time and see if it is declining past unnatural amounts. So what we had seen in general was for salinity and conductivity, which are tied together, it was expected that for all four sites, it would decline from June to July. And this was the trend that we had seen. And of course, this is expected, and many of us can actually attest to the many rainfall events that we had received over the summer. Essentially, as the summer grows warmer and there's more heat, there's going to be more evaporation, and then all that condensation is going to eventually cause all that rain to fall down. So summer naturally has more rainfall than any other season. So with this, it is expected that as the summer progresses and more rainfall events occur over these waters, there's going to be more fresh water added, which is going to lower the salinity. So that's what we had actually seen in all of these sites. For temperature dissolved oxygen and oxygen saturation, all these trends we had seen amongst all four sites was a net increase between the two months. This was also expected. As we know, summer days are longer than the winter, so obviously there's gonna be more exposure to these waters and it's gonna absorb more heat from the sun. In turn, because of this more exposure to the sun, these waters are gonna have more light energy and therefore more potential for phytoplankton or plants to conduct photosynthesis. And therefore, in the end, they'll be able to produce more oxygen and pump it into the system. So for all of these, these increases for these three trends were one way or another expected. For more specific trends, we had seen that Berkeley shows at the lowest salinity amongst the four sites. We had prophesized that this area coincidentally had more rainfall or more runoff from all the rain and it spilling into the ocean. Of course, we weren't able to really test for this. So testing this further would be able to prove that this is true or false. We had also seen that some sites coincidentally had lower oxygen levels than the other sites. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, all of them had an increase in the normal amount of oxygen that was present between the two months. But of course, it's interesting to note that the reason why some of these sites might have lower oxygen levels is essentially Overnight, there's going to be no sun. So, of course, plants cannot really produce oxygen for the system. And this is the same for the other phytoplankton or other photosynthetic organisms that can produce oxygen as well. So, overnight, the oxygen is going to decrease as there's no oxygen being pumped into the system and essentially just being used. Once the morning starts and sunlight starts to go into the system, that oxygen level is going to increase once more. Because of this, if we reach a site coincidentally earliest in the morning, their oxygen level is going to be at the lowest point. So coincidentally, we would actually sample the lowest oxygen level that might not be the normal amount for that site coincidentally. So of course, this bias for some of these sites, for example, with Fork River Lagoon having the lowest oxygen might not be the case. Of course, we would need to test further in the future if this is true or if it was just a coincidence that we'd actually sampled it with the lowest oxygen amount. As I previously mentioned, dock swabs were taken at Summers Beach Lagoon and Berkeley Shores. However, we have actually found out that the information that was collected was incorrect and had to be disregarded for this presentation. And I'd actually given a presentation in June regarding some of this information that was included, but of course it's incorrect, so it cannot be properly included. As we are speaking, the data is currently being processed and of course won't be integrated in time. So of course there's nothing really to discuss, but of course, as I described earlier, these dock swabs would be important to kind of see where in the bay are these sea nettles possibly developing and where we would possibly have to pay attention in the future, just in case these areas actually become a mass breeding ground for these organisms to just start pumping more sea nettles into the environment. So of course, it's, this data would be important just in case we need to keep track of these areas. Excuse me, this is going a little horse again. My apologies. So this slide is essentially going to be a tribute to sea nettles for those who do not necessarily know the life cycle of a jellyfish. For those who were at the dive house the other night, Dr. Bologna had actually given a little presentation on their life cycle and their habits in the ocean. So essentially, to put it simply, we have two forms that some of us are familiar with and another form that we are actually not as familiar with. We have a traditional adult jellyfish described here. This is known as the medusa. And essentially medusa or adult jellyfish will produce sexually by releasing gametes and sperm into the water, which fuse and then produce a new organism. And these new organisms are polyps, which essentially kind of look like sea nettles if you look at it that way. And how these organisms reproduce is essentially they will duplicate themselves, just literally split in half. 
what they can also do is bud off themselves and just create a little smaller version of themselves that'll grow into a bigger version. But an interesting thing that jellyfish do is these polyps will essentially just shift to the side and create a little thing that's known as a podocyst, which will eventually grow into another polyp of its own, and then it just produces a row of these. So of course, over time, you would expect that it's just a very long row of pops developing. So once there's enough of them, you can obviously expect that the growth is really rapid. But over time, what we see is that these polyps strobilate, which is essentially they collect all their energy and they form these little pancake stacks on top of themselves, which are essentially miniature versions of the adult jellyfish that we're more familiar with. And these are called ephyra, which are depicted here. I'll have a slide in the future that will describe what they look like, but essentially they do kind of just look like pancakes or flowers, or if you want to describe them, but they're essentially a very immature version of these bigger versions that we are more familiar with. So of course, it's not only important to monitor the zooplankton populations that the sea nettles would be attacking, but it's important to monitor the sea nettle populations themselves and kind of see, are they growing pest numbers that are healthy? Are they starting to over reproduce? And therefore, are there greater risks to these other populations that we potentially need for not only recreation, but also for economic purposes? So making sure that these sea nettles and their life cycle is not developing in a way that would put not only these ecosystems in danger, but also our well-being in danger is an important step to take nonetheless. And this is a depiction of what these organisms look like under the microscope. Of course, they're not naturally pink. This is just rose bengal that has been applied to the samples in order to really enunciate some of the details. So of course, we have the basic anatomy where we have our stinging tentacles here. We have the main bell and we can see some of the gonads here, which is basically where they hold their gametes and sperm. We see some of the oral arms which they essentially use to capture prey and pull it into their mouth. We actually see a bigger depiction here at the underside for another scene depicted here. And we see an example of Nephira here. Again, it basically looks like a very immature flower-like version of the sea nettles that we may commonly see. So of course, it's important to monitor the life cycles and see how they're developing and see if we need to take further action to kind of hinder their spread. So of course, every project is going to have setbacks. It's an unfortunate thing that's going to happen. And even some professionals are going to experience setbacks. And for some marine biologists and oceanographers, weather is actually a main factor that'll keep us from going out into the field. Because of course, if it's too rough on the water, we're not gonna be able to sample anything because we're gonna be rocking back and forth too much and it's just gonna be havoc. So of course, some days we were able to go out into the field, but others we had been kept out because of the weather. Some of us had car issues that kept us from actually driving to the site. So unfortunately we had to cancel some days as well. One interesting setback, I always love telling the story because I always find it, interesting just to recall and see exactly what happened. So essentially on June 2nd, we were going out from Fort River St. Marina. We were still in the canals and not, not only 30 minutes before we had left from the docks, our boat just died in the water. So of course we started panicking a little bit, but then we eventually decided to paddle back with our nets. We were manually paddling back like it was a kayak for roughly another half hour. And fortunately, a fishing boat had intercepted us and pulled us the rest of the way, but it saved us roughly an hour and a half of time for paddling. But nonetheless, it's important to consider that, yes, these things may happen, but we have to be thankful that we have gone out unscathed and that we we're still able to go out on some days and actually collect data for these projects. Of course, I apologize for all of the abundance of data and all the information that I have provided for this presentation. So I'll do my best to kind of summarize it in a very basic way to make it easier to remember in the future. So essentially, these habitats and their organisms and these ecosystems will show trends and changes in short-term periods of time and long-term periods of time. And monitoring these changes will essentially allow us to see if these organisms are doing well, if they're doing bad, and if we possibly need to make any changes to make sure that they are safe. Because these ecosystems and these organisms in one way or another are important to us. They matter because we have a lot of resources that we take from the water, including some of the fish, either again for recreation or for economic purposes. So without these organisms, we have a major loss without them. And unfortunately, the CNLs in recent years with their boom have been a part of this danger. So they have been hurting us too in one way or another. Nonetheless, the information and data that was collected for this project, data that was collected in the past from previous works and upcoming projects with their data to come are all gonna be important to consider and 
mashed together into one big analysis because we'll be able to see how these organisms are doing on long terms, be able to see what the baseline or the norm for these populations are, and essentially react once we see a change in these population dynamics. And with this effort, we'll be able to preserve Barnegat Bay and the many organisms that we know and love for future generations. I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Paul Bologna for both taking me under his wing and taking me into his project, Montclair State University for providing some of the equipment that we could use for the project, Save Barnicot Bay for providing me with the student grant opportunity, which I'm very thankful for, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection for funding said grant, and Berkeley Township's Underwater Search and Rescue Team for partnering with the CNL team. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Nice job. Thank you. Awesome. You went over a lot of things, and I don't know that I have any questions. Um, so yeah, that was a really great overview of everything to do with every kind of jellyfish that you were mainly finding, as well as other zooplankton mm -hmm. and the results of your uh, work, which shows locations of the animals and the density and everything else like that. So just mm -hmm. if you're watching this YouTube video afterward, you can find the written report that Anthony has worked on with Dr. Pavlonia at www.savebarnagatay.org. Click on the word educate and then scroll down and find the student grant button. That will show you all the reports from this year and years past. If you have any questions about any of this work, I can send you over to these students if you email me at education at savebarnagatay.org. And that way uh, we can get you all the answers to these questions that you might have. Um, yeah, great job. Do you have anything else to add about the student grant program or any of the work that you did? Well, as I mentioned earlier, of course, it's a complicated process to kind of get everything together and work every day on these samples and just compile it all. But of course, this work that we are going to be doing is a small piece of this very big puzzle that at the end of the day is going to help a lot of people not only keep these environments safe that they enjoy being on, but also just to make sure that some of the things and resources that we love to keep using is going to be able to be used in the future as well. Yeah, that's a really great point that the work you shared with us here is really just one, uh, you know, month and a half of sampling data of Dr. Pavlone's work that takes, you know, years to come up with um, results for his paper. So definitely look up Dr. Paul Bologna at Montclair State University uh, for more in-depth uh, research uh, questions answered based on Barnegat Bay uh, plankton and jellyfish sampling. So nice job, Anthony. Uh, if anyone's so watching later on, definitely um, get in touch with us.